Okay. Our second presentation is by Julia Crowley Ferenga and Patrick, Patrick Loftus from Evanston Township High School in Evanston, Illinois, and it's entitled Morphological Classification of Post Starburst Galaxies. Thank you. Get that laser pointer. Hello, I'm Julia. I'm Patrick. And our study was on the morphological classification of post starburst galaxies. Now, the field of post starburst galaxies is relatively new and ill understood. And only in about the past 10 years or so have astronomers begun to, with morphological classifications such as this one, shed light on some of the intricacies of galaxy evolution. Specifically, we looked at how galaxies go from blue and star forming to so-called red and dead. And they get these names based on their integrated star composition. That is to say, the light from all the stars in their galaxy tends to be bluer and younger stars because blue stars are high mass, hot, and go supernova quicker. And that leaves behind red, cooler, longer lived stars in the red and dead. To understand this transition, we will discuss two major theories. The first theory relates to small, isolated galaxies and postulates that when many supernovae or the dust and explosions of stars occur at the same time, that the dust and gas expelled by these explosions cannot be contained within the galaxy because it is so small and has a weak gravitational force. And this dust and gas escapes from the galaxy into space, preventing future star formation. The second theory is the major merger theory, which is when two galaxies actually collide. And what happens is that the gas and dust clouds around the galaxies intersect. And then the compression of the gas and dust causes a large burst in star formation, which essentially expels gas from both of the galaxies. And what's left behind is a single galaxy that's relatively devoid of fuel for star formation. To test these two theories, we looked at a certain type of galaxy called a post-starburst galaxy. A post-starburst galaxy is a type of galaxy that has recently undergone a rapid burst in star formation. Now, star formation occurs when gas and dust cool under its own gravity and compresses to form stars, or when that dust and gas is forced into a smaller volume. And the star burst within the entire galaxy itself is usually caused by some sort of disruption in the galaxy's path. Now, post-starburst galaxies are a unique galaxy type of galaxy, and they're relatively rare because the post-starburst phase itself is before the galaxy turns into a non-star forming galaxy is only 900 million years long, which sounds like a really long time, but this is actually only 10% of a galaxy's on average 12 billion year life. To identify our sample as a post-starburst galaxy and to distinguish post-starburst galaxy from normal star forming and non-star forming, we looked at the galaxy spectrum. Now, the spectrum is a graph of wavelengths of light versus intensity and is indicative of temperature and composition. As you can see, the spectrum for a post-starburst galaxy is very different from the spectrum of a normal star-forming galaxy and that of a non-star-forming galaxy. This suggests that post-starburst galaxies are fundamentally different from the other two types. So to get our sample, we took images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a a uh, telescope and a spectrometer located in New Mexico. And we looked at 2,811 pictures of post-starburst galaxies from about redshift of 0.05 to 0.12. And redshift is actually a measure of distance from Earth. So it translates to half a billion light years to 1.2 billion light years out from Earth. Patrick and I conducted a morphological classification, which means it's a visual classification of images of galaxies. So to begin with, we looked at a sample, a small sample of 300 galaxies and created separate pre preliminary classification systems based on the characteristics that we saw that were most prominent in that small sample. And then we came together and discussed and finalized our new system, which we applied to all 2,811 galaxies. What you're looking at right now is an example of a spreadsheet that we used to keep track of our data. We would look at the image of the galaxy and then place its number under relevant columns to its appearance. For example, you can see number 1700 has one neighbor touching its dominant, its shape of a circle, and it's blue. Our final system had categories regarding shape, color, neighbors, and brightness of center. We will discuss the two categories most relevant to our conclusions, shape and neighbors. So the shape of a galaxy is important because it indicates some sort of violent disturbance in the galaxy's past. 
That is, if a galaxy actually came close to the target galaxy and the gravitational potential wells actually caused the target galaxy to rip off a large portion of its uh, gas and dust, or when two galaxies merge and the resulting increase in angular velocity of the spinning throws off some of the mass. So we had to differentiate between the, uh, the extent to which the galaxy was disturbed. So we, looked, we s made separate categories for a large bright tidal arm or a small faint tidal arm, and then everywhere in between. Neighbors are indicative of a current merger or a possibly a past merger or some weak gravitational interaction of possible near miss. An interesting phenomenon occurs when trying to determine whether galaxies are neighbors called superpositioning. And this is a phenomenon that occurs based on the perspective from Earth. It's when uh, gra uh, galaxies appear to be close enough to interact gravitationally, but are really too far to interact. Uh, you can think of it as the three stars in Orion's belt. They look like they're all on a level plane, but really they're different depths from Earth. And our perspective just makes it look like they're on the same plane. So to determine whether the, images, the galaxies in the image were actually close enough to interact gravitationally, we had to look at both objects' redshift which, as Patrick said, is a measure of distance, and we determine whether they were close enough to affect each other gravitationally. So this is uh, an example of one of the 2,811 images we looked at. We had described this galaxy as having a bright center. It appears yellowish white. It has two very large bright tidal arms, and it has a possible neighbor depending on its redshift. Sometimes we would encounter images of galaxies that didn't fit nicely into one certain category, so we would have to just make a judgment call based on our previous experience with the classification system or our intuition. And that's something really hard for computers to do. You would have to quantify the subtle distinctions, and it's very hard. So that's why Patrick and I had to classify each one by hand. So what we found in our study was that the evolution of galaxies is heavily based on the mass of the galaxy. We looked at high mass galaxies, which is greater than 5 times 10 to the 11th times the mass of our sun and low mass galaxies, which is less than that number. We separated those two masses, and then we looked at the percentage of disturbance, that is what we mentioned earlier, which was neighbors and tidal arms. And we found that high mass galaxies tend to have a much higher percentage of disturbance than low mass galaxies. So what we concluded from this was that high mass galaxies undergo mergers to stop star formation, while low mass galaxies can actually undergo some sort of isolated event solely because their gravitational potential well is small enough for gas to just be released from the galaxy. And what's actually interesting about this is, up until recently, major mergers were thought to be the really primary theory in stopping star formation among galaxies. But what this shows is that there has to be something different going on in the small galaxies to, to stop star formation. In comparing our results and conclusions to previous morphological classifications of post-starburst galaxies, it's essential to look at sample size. Because sample size results in a type of uncertainty called statistical uncertainty, which is based purely on sample size and doesn't take into account systematic uncertainties or human error. These uh, past four studies had sample size of at most 56, resulting in a statistical uncertainty of more than 12%. What's important about our study is that our sample size of 2,811 is the largest study of, of post-starburst galaxies. And because of our sample size, our statistical uncertainty is about 2%, which means we have a much higher confidence in our results and conclusions. For future research, we propose classifying a control sample of non-post-starburst galaxies of similar mass and redshift to our sample to determine their percentage of disturbed galaxies and compare it to our percentage. That way, we'd be able to, to determine whether the percentage of disturbed galaxies that we calculated was unique to only post-starburst galaxies or may, in fact, be a universal percentage. We'd also like to take a look at the 35% of galaxies that showed no evidence of mergers or disturbance. And we'd like to basically look at a higher resolution image, because we think that with a higher resolution, we, we, with a finer eye for detail, we might be able to pick up on a tidal arm or some sort of cloud that came off the galaxy that we couldn't see, or maybe a neighbor that was sort of lost in the background noise. So we might be able to see a higher percentage of disturbance solely based on the resolution of the images. We would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Laura Truey, and our physics teacher, Dr. Mark Vandrasik as well as our parents and the Siemens Foundation and George Washington University for making this all possible. Thank you.
the world faces problems unlike any before. Grand challenges of our time, requiring innovative solutions. The scholars, faculty, and students of the George Washington University take on these challenges every day.